Let me see. All right, I made you the co-host. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Let me see if I can. And as you all know, Julia is here from the Department of Economic Community Development, and she's going to give a presentation and also solicit some feedback about the 10-year economic development plan. Yes. So let's see if you can you see this. Why can I? Yes. We can see your PowerPoint screen. Okay. Are we good? Good. Great. So um, thank you, everybody. Good morning. Um, as Sylvie pointed out, uh, my name is Julia Trujillo-Lengo, and I work for the main Department of Economic and Community Development. Um, I say that I wear a big sombrero for the department, um, but my primary role in the department is the implementation of the statewide 10-year strategy, among many other things. Um, including talent attraction, direct business assistance, all our DEI initiatives, and many other areas um, of work. Um, but um, this morning, I will be primarily discussing the 10-year plan. But if questions arise, um, I often say I'm not the best multitasker. So if, if folks on Zoom, um, so if, if, if folks have questions or you utilize the chat, um, still you can help me kind of monitor it. But Absolutely, I'll monitor uh, it is intended to be somewhat of a conversation. I'm going to be uh, delivering some information at the beginning, uh, but then hopefully most of our time will be devoted to um, engaging and discussing with each other. So um, I often start with sort of a, a, a history and a journey into this 10 year strategy to, to just get everybody on the same page. Um, the 10-year economic development plan was born back in November of 2019 after um, several decades without a statewide um, strategic uh, economic development plan of its kind. Uh, then uh, in, at the same time, um, the comprehensive workforce strategy uh, led by the state workforce board uh, was released at the time. The two documents um, somewhat speak to one another, but I often say, you know, that they have a common dialect, but it's not an exact language. So we're we're going at this refresh together because both of these documents are hitting the five-year mark soon, and we would like to refresh them intentionally, um, speaking to one another. So when we're talking about um, our workforce strategy and the work that is led by the state workforce board. And we're talking about federal funding um, for workforce training and workforce strategies. Uh, we were in full alignment, um, and that everyone can can look at both documents and and and, and coordinate. And you know, I think often the state uh, puts forth a uh, a willingness and a and an ask of community partners and others to collaborate. Um, so we're also trying to model that and be proactive at uh, ensuring that these two documents speak to one another. Then, of course, after 2019, three months after the fact, we get hit by something that we're all familiar with, which is the global pandemic, um, March 2020. Economic recovery report um, emerges out of that. Maybe some of you were part of that um, committee that put the report together. Essentially, heavily influenced, inspired, drawn, um, um, inspirations by the framework of the 10-year plan, but it responds uh, uniquely to the, the, the circumstances of the pandemic, both the challenges and the opportunities um, that emerge um, out of that. And then 2021, we have the American Rescue Plan, um, or the Maine Jobs and Recovery Plan, as we call it here in Maine, as approved by the governor and the legislature through uh, LD 1733. That is sort of um, uh, our investment blueprint. Um, again, Maine was in a unique position in comparison to other states because we already had a skeleton. We already had a 10-year plan. So we already had the opportunity to um, invest um, quasi-strategically. There's not a 100% alignment, but I think there's probably a 70% alignment with a 10-year plan versus other states that really had to figure out where and how these dollars were going to be invested to move the state forward. So um, I will reference the main jobs and recovery plan often. Um, that's where it comes from. 
And then lastly, um, I have been in this position for almost two years in January. So one of the um, ask was, where are we at in this 10-year plan? Um, can we pause, uh, ascertain status, pulse, to see, is it still relevant? Are the actions and the initiatives within the plan respond to, to the circumstances of today? So that's kind of a, a journey of the many, many plans of plans of plans. I've, I've, I've not put all the plans in here to not uh, overwhelm you, but if you've heard of other plans, like the broadband action plan, the innovation, all of that, I'm tracking and pulling into this discussion. I just did not want to overwhelm folks within this conversation. So if there's uh, something that uh, is worth remembering about this 10-year plan is that it has three goals and seven strategies. The three goals are grow the average annual wage by 10%, increase what we sell per worker by 10%, and probably the one that has stuck the most with folks is attract 75,000 people to Maine's talent pool. Um, also, I think uh, it, it is ironic. So I was part of the original steering committee that created the plan. So I'm, I'm right behind the governor. You know, those of you who have met me in person know I'm not very tall, so you can't see me, but uh, but I, I get sort of the, the gift or the curse, I'm not really sure, but uh, that I was part of that um, first element and foundation of that plan. And now I'm here implementing the full strategy. Um, so when it comes to the three goals, uh, good news or semi good news in the in two, at least two of the three goals um our our wages our real annual wages are up um we're about 12 percent um and that constitutes seventh best growth in the nation uh we th th that um, is taking into consideration inflation so usually how i explain it to folks is that you, it, it is it it is a positive element that our wages are up if they weren't with the inflation circumstances we we probably would be much worse um but um both in the real annual wage and the real value while we sell per worker we were almost at 13 percent when our, our target was 10 percent um we're our third best growth in the nation overall we're digging a little bit deeper we have an, ex an executive steering committee that has asked for the questions, you know, what motivated this? How does this reflect um, across our state in different regions? So then we have we have a better, more meaningful conversation with regions that maybe this doesn't correlate across the board. It doesn't correlate across all populations. So this is our first attempt to kind of pause and ascertain where we are and, and where we're going further down into the weeds to to ask further questions. When it comes to the 75,000 goal, um, I, how I usually explain it is that there's two forces that sort of feed into that uh, into that numeric value of 13,400. Um, labor force participation varied throughout post-pandemic times. We can remember right after the pandemic, high unemployment rate. Now our unemployment rate is at pre-pandemic times quite low. Um, our labor force participation overall is around 62% for the entirety of the population. But what I often like to highlight to folks is that when it comes to our prime working age, so our 25 to 55 years old, um, we're actually at 85% of labor force participation and we're on par, if not higher than the national, than the national average. So that explains a little bit of the constant persistent questions of where did the people go? Most folks are indeed working. We have a very small margin of those who are in that prime working age um, um, target group that, that are, are not working. So um, I'm happy to explain that further if helpful now or at a different time. And then the other phenomenon that feeds into the 75,000 is the immigration that occurred after 2020. So um, as probably a lot of you are aware, um, we there there um, I think it overall net migration, we have hit mark um, numbers and marks that, that we have not hit since like the early 1950s. Um, so for a long time, we were talking about our demographic winter discussion and our earlier population. Um, I think there's 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 signals 
that our population, like we were the uh, one of two states um, this past year that our median age actually went down. So they're from a population perspective, leave all the other, like what I said, the, the, the three amigos, the transportation, housing, and, Leaving that aside from a very sole population perspective, there's positive signals. Um, and domestic migration is really the driver of, of this shift, not so much international migration, which some folks um, may misunderstand that. Um, and, 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 and it is by a large margin. So domestic migration, we were seventh in the nation overall in 2021, and we were uh, 11th in 2022. Um, we were uh, 42nd um, from 2010 to 2020 um, in in our population growth overall, and uh, in 2021 we moved to 14th. So um, so things are shifting. Also from a diversity perspective, if it's helpful to understand that, um, in the 2022 numbers show that 60% uh, of those who migrated to Maine, this is both international and domestic, 60% um, of them were non-white, non-Hispanic populations. So it, it sort of correlates um, with, with where our state is, is going and has been going for the last few years. So that's a little bit of the 75,000 um, where, of course, there's a lot of um, it, the, the post-pandemic times were tricky for all of us. We're trying to, again, pause and see, are, are these trends going to continue? Is there more research to be done? So we're doing a lot of research in the talent attraction um, area. Um, if you get a survey from me, we're now trying to survey uh, all new residents from uh, March 2020 to December 2022, which accounts for about 60,000 overall. We have 40,000 people that we can actually reach out to with complete data sets um, to understand what motivated their move. Are they working for a company outside of Maine? Um, wh what what brought you to Maine? You have existing ties to Maine. Just a lot of these anecdotal information that we've all been hearing, but where we don't have solid research behind it. So that's going to be uh, released in, in a few weeks. So um, I'll pass to the next slide unless anybody has questions. So the seven strategies is what I call uh, our, our skeleton. Um, we have um, our grow local talent strategy that looks at uh, existing residents and how uh, we can address those that are not in the labor force, those that are in the labor force and, and would like further training and further their skills and et cetera. So it's really working with our, our residents today. Attract new talent speaks of talent outside of Maine and, and how we can be better poised to attract that talent, retain that talent, and, and ensure that both strategy A and B are speaking to one another. Um, strategy C, promote innovation, um, a lot in the innovation space, uh, entrepreneurship, startups, kind of that, that area. Uh, strategy D, ubiquitous connectivity that we're trying to change it to a uh, different word so I can actually say it um, without a little bit of going like that, um, uh, is our broadband strategy. Strategy E, supporting infrastructure, um, childcare, transportation, housing, um, a little bit of energy. Um, I will say then on strategy E, before we get into the discussion, um, not a lot on housing. Um, a very tiny action on housing. Um, so that's uh, an area where I think uh, we definitely have an opportunity to grow. Uh, maintain stable business environment, um, just regulations, permits, um, and any other sort of bureaucratic elements that 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 um, uh, slow down business growth. And then lastly, promote hubs of excellence speaks of a lot of different elements that exist in communities that 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 could create this this hub of excellence through both innovation, um, cultural assets, supply chain assets, uh, but that the state could um, support it by by supporting those communities in, in, in really putting all the pieces together. Um, when it comes to the workforce board, 
as I said, I think the next slide is a little bit um, easier to understand. We are partnering with each other to make sure that, again, the, the funding and the supports through our workforce channels align. Um, they have done a great job at already aligning very well with the 10-year plan. Um, you might have heard of the 60% of Maine's workforce will hold a credential value by 2025. That's something that a lot of different systems are adhering to. Uh, but essentially, I think what you need to know is that we're kind of wor we're working with each other. So, so we don't call on you three times to get feedback. So we get solid feedback from everyone, and, and that um, is translated and adapted into our next iteration. So when it comes to the progress report, um, I think this slide is, is probably the most helpful, um, is what we call the progress at a glance. It gives us a sense of where we are across the entirety of the plan, uh, whether the activities are pending in progress or completed or, or achieved. Um, you can, there's some strategies like, uh, that what we're now trying to call build internet connections, uh, that we have achieved a lot of the work across the board just because we did not think that we were going to get this level of funding back in 2019. We we would have we, we never thought this was going to to happen to this degree. It doesn't mean that when we say complete or achieve that we don't need more funding, we don't need more loans. What we're saying is that what we what we were charged to do back in 2019, we've actually reached it. But these projects and these activities initiatives could be expanded. They, they may still feel relevant, so we want to keep them. Um, so that's kind of what we're trying to do today is looking at this kind of work um, and, and ascertain what is it that we missed. Um, I pointed out housing being one of them. It, it really doesn't speak very much of housing. Um, and, um, and, but it is a good thing. I think that in infrastructure at that time, we were even talking about infrastructure, pointing out that childcare was key to infrastructure, transportation, um, and again, housing and promote hubs of excellence is probably a strategy we're most behind because, uh, I think the state, we, we haven't had time or the capacity to to support communities in that way to really help them understand. Okay, am I a hubs of excellence? How how do we define a hubs of excellence, etc. Um, when it comes to your work, I mean, I think you find yourself in many different areas, um, but I think this is a unique area that also requires um, more TLC. Um, it it got in here a quality of place investments, but. Uh, I think we we could probably um, unpeel some layers to this onion a little bit more and and really hear from you, you know what could what could be helpful. What, what are priorities that that are um, have continued to emerge that you just don't don't seem to um, get the support that you need or um, that are not elevated to this degree. Something and and then I think this is my one of my last slides um, is that the ten year plan speaks of these core themes. So then then it, it 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 challenges us I think to to think differently about industries and it talks about these sort of clusters of industries and they call them thematic areas in the plan. Um, it I put just some examples here that are included in the plan. We're hoping that. Um, in this refresh, we're also talking about these thematic areas and industry-specific actions and initiatives within the seven strategies. Uh, the other component that we're also kind of hoping to, to address is that when we speak of talent, we're only speaking of talent in this current plan and solely two strategies. We're hoping to break talent all across seven strategies. So then when we're talking about broadband, we can't achieve our broadband goals if we don't have the talent. We can't achieve our infrastructure goals. We can't have a world-class system of childcare. We don't have talent and so on. So, so that is not opaquely looked at in just two strategies, but that we're braiding in. And the same with this, the end industry level work to also braid it in into the initiatives and action level. So my two asks, and then I'll uh, be quiet and let you ask questions and engage, um, is that we're holding regional meetings all across our state to have these conversations that we are having today, but 
uh, with a mix of folks and stakeholders, we make make sit um, also rich in its own way. There's value in meeting with folks like you who are really dedicated to a very specific core uh, mission or area of work, but there's also great value in bringing a lot of different people together in one region. We've held the one in Scarborough, the one in Lewiston, um, and the one in Damascata. And so next week we have the one in Fairfield and then we have um, our Northern Maine and Down East tour. So I can send um, after the fact the registrations for these. So if you, you live in one of these areas, even if you participated today, we, we welcome you in one of these regional meetings. And then for our discussion, um, I know I went, I went quite fast, but um, this is not intended to be prescriptive. So if you're seeing or you hear, you know, housing is indeed a priority, but we feel that that broadband is still crucial and the elements in broadband expansion that you should really be thinking about are this and this and that. So what actions uh, do you consider still relevant and important in today's economy? Um, in which actions and priorities that you have um, could be elevated to this level at the 10 year plan um, so we can support it um, in a variety of ways. So that those are my two questions, but I'm happy to also um, engage in broader conversations, whatever is helpful. And I I will, oops, no, that's the part later. Um, uh, I'm gonna take the questions and put them in the chat uh, once. So I, I'll stop sharing so then we can see each other and it's easier for me to also take notes and. Um, be more engaged with that, if that's okay. So you'd like questions to come through the chat? No, I'm just going to put the questions in the chat so people can reference them in the chat. Right. But um, verbally is better for me, but happy yeah. to do it either way. Julia, do you want me to take notes when people talk so you can just facilitate? That'd be great. I mean, I'm used to running this uh, show, but when I get help, I, 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 I have learned not to say no. So great. I'll do Thanks, that. Delilah. And Dave, I know you had a question. Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for that thorough overview. That's really, really helpful. Um, you touched on something that I had read, which was that the department was conducting research to better understand that those in-migration um, patterns. And so it's great to hear that that's going to be coming out in the next um, couple of weeks. In that, I'm wondering, will there, will there be uh, like expansion on some of those target areas that it sounds like your department has focused on you you talked a lot about like talent attraction it sounds like the state has identified like people with ties uh to maine like you mentioned um young families recent college graduates um and then also kind of remote workers and, and new americans i'm wondering like is that are you were those like hypothesis that you're trying to prove out in that um in that research or, or how did you get at those target audiences and then will there also be a better understanding of that like geography of that in migration so i guess the there's a long-winded way of saying like what are the things you're trying to get at with that in migration and with those target audiences as you currently define them how did you how did you get at those um how, how did you get at those audiences are oh, you on mute julia thank you i i i'm, I'm glad i'm not in the most recent times after the pandemic, my staff would have to do 10 push-ups every time somebody said, you're on mute. Um, <laughs> and I just got my COVID shot yesterday, my flu shot. So <laughs> no longer the case. Um, so that's a big question. Um, I think what I can say is that our, our talent attraction um, research and, and strategy has sort of three buckets. Uh, one is that we wanted to learn, um, have a national scan of what are other states doing, um, what has translated into actual effective talent attraction strategies. Some of you might have heard, for example, about Vermont and, and the incentive, the monetary incentive that you get when if you move to Vermont. So, so we've done a research study that highlights eight best practices, three deep dives, and catalogs a hundred different talent attraction strategies all around the country. So, so that we're kind of learning our space before we decide to have a, a, a concrete strategy. Um, then the other piece is we are also uh, um, surveying employers. So we've surveyed about um, almost 1200 employers 
to understand their talent attraction strategies, who they're seeking to attract, um, what are their barriers, uh, how can the state would be helpful um, if we had some sort of an incentive or supportive program of sorts. Um, so that's second. And then the third is learning from the actual migrants and understand if we were to put a package together, what would have been helpful to those that already moved? And probably even more importantly, what would have been helpful for those who did not end up moving? Um, so, you know, housing is probably a, a, what we are hearing. I mean, early pandemic, we were hearing a lot about um, the spouse or the partners that could not find another opportunity, but now it's more the housing, the housing piece, and also take um, trying to target the, the retention piece so that um, a lot of remote workers were also hearing anecdotally that are knocking on local job opportunities, but, um, or they don't know who to go to with their skill set. So, so there's a lot that we are trying to learn at this point when it comes to the populations that, that we're targeting. It, it comes from a lot of that research um, already and, and also the in-demand jobs uh, and occupations that we have here in our state. So it's a mix. So I hope that sort of answered your question. It, yeah, it does. I know we need to probably move on. Uh, the reason why I was asking was I was, it sounds like you talked a little, you, you brought it up on one of your last slides around like the quality of place and the role that place plays and thinking about the people on this call and the, in the work that we do. One of the things I'm trying to figure out is how closely the tourism data and like that market analysis overlays with that immigration, thinking about the work that we do, right? So trying to figure out is the is the geography similar? Are those target audiences similar, or are they dramatically different? So I'm just was trying to get an understanding of if there's dissonance there, or if they overlay nicely. And and maybe if it's helpful, David, just because you know we can get really in depth in all of this. If it is of interest either to you or to the group, I can come back and and actually share a lot of this population. We have a lot of the data where people have moved to, where people are moving from and how it correlates with our tourism data. Um, so if that's helpful, and I can also send some um, uh, general slides that illustrate that um, after the meeting as well, if helpful. That would be really helpful. Thank you so much for that offer. And I appreciate the time to ask the question. Christina, go ahead. Um, kind of in line with that, uh, I have a couple of things. Um, I'm up in Skowhegan, by the way. I'm the main street director in Skowhegan. Um, so kind of in line with that, I, uh, I've read through this plan a number of times back when it first came out. And then pretty much every time I write a grant that has anything to do with economic development. Um, and I it's um, I think it's got great parts in it, but I've it's always struck me that um, tourism has been left out of the equation and then um, outdoor recreation though mentioned in, in the plan. And I think maybe outdoor recreation has become more um, prolific as a as a talent attraction tool um, since the pandemic. But um, those are two places that I felt like it um, kind of left things out. And particularly interesting was the fact that they were both they both fall under the economic development DECD umbrella. So um, I'm just curious to know, or I guess my recommendation would be that I think it would be great to see more tourism um, data and connection to the work that MOT is doing and the the connection to well, the work that Carol Ann is doing, um, because I think that these are both important um, strategies for the state uh, moving forward, um, especially as we talk about like quality uh, or excuse me, um, place based economic development and tourism uh, talent attraction related to our assets. So those are things that I always think about as we as I look at the plan. Um, I do agree that housing was left out also, and I think it's a huge need and a huge issue in, in the state. So I definitely would, you know, double down on that as a, as a suggestion for um, adding to the plan um, and transportation is another one. Um, and then I'm curious, my que I have a question though. Um, what I've always been curious about the hubs of excellence. Um, and I think, you know, from my perspective, Skowhegan and Waterville, and we're doing some work together, we just got a, a grant actually from MOT to do some more strategy development around um, destination development and our brand for the region. So Waterville and Skowhegan being a potential new hub of excellence. And I see that you guys hadn't really done a lot of work around that, which I kind of expected, but I'm curious to know what the next steps might be around that and how we might um, kind of position ourselves to be a, a hub of excellence um, in the state's eyes and how we might get support for that. Thank you for your comments and, and question. Um, 
I, I think that's why I, I try to highlight the quality of place action because it's the closest thing to what you're trying to say, which, which it, it shouldn't be something that I have to sort of search for and where are we um, highlighting those elements. So I think there's an opportunity to grow there. Um, when it comes to the hubs of excellence, um, I, it is a priority of ours that in probably late spring, we have a a more defined package as to how communities come can plug into this work we're also doing some i think rural revitalization work and how that integrates with the hubs of excellence um so i'm happy to share more information as it becomes available uh, but we're we're targeting late spring to 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 um develop that area that has been um sort of dormant Thanks. And does DECD have a mailing list that I should get on? Because I don't feel like I'm looped into all this stuff and hear about things after the fact. I'm going to add it to the list of like, I'm not the only one asking for it, people. So, okay. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Thanks. And if you haven't seen the questions in the chat, Julia added those questions in there of just what do you consider consider is still relevant from um, what was presented? and important to the economy and what are some additions, which Christina did a great job kind of addressing both of those questions. Amy, was that a hand up? Oh, okay, Delilah. Um, I'll see if I can take notes at the same time, but probably not. Um, definitely the housing piece. I just heard that we need 75,000 more housing units to be ready for 15 years from now or something like that. So really specific. I mean, I think the numbers are there. So having those in the plan. Um, it seems like there should be some context about climate change and preparation for that as part of the economic plan. Um, I know that it impacts um, in migration. Um, but that's kind of more from a crisis standpoint. As So how could we how could we welcome that in migration as part of a, a climate impact? Um, and I know that's kind of tricky because some communities don't ne aren't necessarily prepared or don't think of themselves as a place that would be welcoming to newcomers. So um, how do we incentivize people getting excited about that? Um, I was at an English language learning class the other day and there were people from seven different countries um, and um, they were teachers, engineer, construction worker, um, student, you know, um, a lot of different work. But, um, you know, if, if those housing, language learning, supportive environment pieces aren't in place, um, I think that's it. Thank you for that. So I'm I'm gonna put in the chat the the report that Lila referenced and the news is the housing report that just came out last week. Dense but interesting nevertheless, and it really gives us a great picture to to and a blueprint to act upon. Um, I the the other pieces about. Um, Climate change. That's one of the questions we're asking in the survey for my of migrants too, and 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 and, and how many, uh, that was a consideration for them, and it's definitely a consideration for us as we're trying to um, take on this strategy. Uh, and then lastly, the newcomers piece, especially the the international migrants. Um, in the current plan, there's only one reference in attract new talent that speaks mostly of. Um, sort of the, the licensure component of things and how to um, optimize uh, prior skills and, and learning and practice here in our state um, through the main jobs and recovery plan and what I oversee directly, we've dedicated a lot of talent attraction funding to um, try to mitigate some of those barriers. So there's reciprocity 
Uh, for other states, there's recipro no reciprocity with inter the international market, but there are other things like provisional licensure and things that we, we are looking at and also understanding what other states are doing so we can be ahead of them. Um, so, so we're perceived as that state where, where folks, uh, for example, a cab driver in Philly who is an electric engineer would really like to continue to practice something that is dear to his heart and his soul and his identity all his life. And that Maine offers that opportunities with the talent that we need. So we're doing a lot of that work in that space and trying to also consider um, other investments like the New Mainers Resource Center that was in Portland or is in Portland. Now it's being expanded into Lewiston and Bangor uh, and, and doing um, other things that are going to come out at the beginning of the year to, to equip communities to try to strive for that sense of belonging for everyone. So um, lots um, in the works. Thanks. Amy, go ahead. Um, I know that people, um, hi Julia. Um, I know people have already mentioned the housing piece. Um, one thing that is not addressed in the plan, um, which I know people like the silo is uh, homelessness. Um, it's, it, it, it does affect our economic development, does affect you know, our economy and um, our businesses and our ability to attract talent and all of those things. And um, because it is such a an issue at the moment, it feels like maybe it should be mentioned in some capacity. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I know it's in other plans, but I didn't know if there was an issue or a, a plan to to consider that in this space as well. Thank you for that. Yeah, then we're, 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 again, as we're talking about housing, how, how do we um, look at the at the comprehensive elements of housing that there's 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 a lot of layers to it, but that we're not just looking at it in in one siloed way, but that we're looking at the, at the entirety of, of the complex challenge. Um, I'm also curious, I guess if I may ask, I mean, some of you represent probably different regions and different realities. Um, when we talk about housing, what we're at, what we're trying to achieve in these initiatives is is trying to be probably bolder than we were and and granular. So if there are specific projects that you're seeing, initiatives that you're seeing in your cities, towns, regions, counties that that you think are promising, the promising would be it, it would be great to to elevate them and and either share them with me at this time or a later time, email them so we can we can consider them. Like we've heard things that are happening in Freeport, things that are happening um, in in the Madison area, things that are happening in Washington County, just just so that we're talking about and elevating realities that are not only from one geographical area in the state. So I don't know if that generated some thoughts for folks. Yeah, Cara, jump name, in. Um, yeah, my name is Cara Romano. Um, I, I work in Ellsworth. Um, and what I'm noticing uh, in our region, and I know many folks uh, on here have participated, perhaps assisted or led the charge with their municipalities on working on second and third story housing for vacant spaces that currently exist in the Main Street District. Um, our downtown uh, specifically, uh, what I find one of the biggest challenges is A, the building owners perhaps not having the money to invest in their second and third story developments that currently sit empty. But the other big hurdle I think is the fact that the local municipality can't see sort of past or around building codes and fire codes and all of those sorts of things. And there is not a lot of um, perhaps sort of looking to the past to see where these families that owned these buildings and perhaps built them lived above them and then operated uh, a store or a restaurant or something else um, in the first floor. And that whole concept of mixed use, um, you know, is just something that's foreign to municipalities perhaps today. And so how can the state of Maine sort of work with the municipalities to either provide um, some sort of 
training or uh, concepts around, um, you know, how to kind of embrace this. I really feel in Ellsworth specifically that um, a big key to uh, perhaps coming up with quick housing units that are, are safe and affordable um, would be the development of these second and third stories. Um, but we're not going to be able to do that until uh, our local code can sort of embrace it. And the only other thing that I will say is, is that the folks who do own the buildings in the downtown, they want, I think they do want this to happen because for them, when they have sort of different revenue streams, it helps them continue to afford the taxes. It helps them to keep the spaces mm -hmm. full. And it also helps us in Ellsworth. I know other main streets are are different, but I would say easily 75% of our buildings in our downtown are locally owned and they are owner occupied, which is a huge, huge thing um, and a huge boon to our local economy because those people are on site every day when a light bulb is burnt out or a tenant has an issue, chances are they're right there and they're going to be able to fix it. And I think it's a big boon to our downtown, but we have this problem um, and it would be lovely to sort of have a way for our municipality to embrace the Main Street model um, and to have the state sort of provide some sort of programming or or just some assistance or educational how-to. Um, thank you. We've heard that um, in the regional meetings that we've held so far. So um, it just further validates the, the importance and the and, and a tangible thing that we can that, that we can do. So always like that. Any other thoughts, ideas? Amy? I have another one. Um I um for the last couple of years I've been involved in a project, um, which unfortunately is currently stalled, but it is and this is separate from my work, but it's um it was an affordable housing development with a child care facility incorporated it was a community there's um there's a provision in the uh, affordable housing funding stream called a community facility and it allows for um a first year floor use that is different than the affordable housing and you can put if you're serving primarily low to moderate income people you can put a it, it provides some additional subsidy in the creation of that and i think to me it seems like a no brainer so like mm -hmm to address two very, very big problems um, and provide additional subsidy for the creation of more childcare spaces throughout the state. Um, Thank you. And I, I, I don't think it has legs yet at the state, but I would love mm -hmm. for a champion. Any other questions? Or recommendations for additions or areas that you wanna highlight that you saw in the plan and think are still important. You touched on a lot of the big ones. Delilah. Um, Christina mentioned something about, mentioned something about like tourism not being very mm -hmm. focused on, is that is that correct? Um, and I was just, wondering is that kind of a a main thing like we no because I mean it seems like so is there resistance to making tourism part of our economic development plan or was it more kind of like it's such a given here yeah I I mean um if if I go into memory lane um and I was in part in all the all, in all the discussions. I was mostly um, involved in the grow local talent and attract new talent uh, working groups. I, but I think it was a little bit more of a given that is it's not something that really required as much attention as other areas that perhaps now we give get um, take for granted. Um, but I think there's a way to better illustrate both what's here as a as a core element of our economic engine and also address some gaps or silos that are associated like something like for example talent attraction um i i we have an interagency group internally across different departments tourism is a core pillar of that group so i've included them into this discussion 
um, even though it is not exactly a hundred percent what they do, but they're so important in our in our brain main brand, how to attract that talent, how to retain that talent, all of it is and I guess I'm I'm also kind of a person that is is comfortable in the gray, not only in the black and white, so I can see how things connect. Um, so I think there's an opportunity to to do that, but I don't think it was intentional as that saying that this is not an important part of our economy, is that there were other elements that 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 they wanted to highlight at the time. I want, uh, and just if it's okay, just to add on to that. I mean, I think somewhat related, um, you talked about braiding talent in through all of this. I mean, I think if you, if, and I'd be curious to, as you look at that national scan that you mentioned, I would think most of the states that saw success during that period you're looking at tied, um, like, again, they, they also are good tourism areas where there's great outdoor recreation, thinking about all of, like, a lot of those places, um, the reason why they saw immigration was because people went there for some, a tourism activity, said, hey, this would be a great place to live and work. And then they they they, they moved from a major metropolitan area to that. You know what I mean? And, um, and so I think it is all braided together. And I would I would be I would be curious as you look at that national scan, um, if that if that if that overlays, because I, I think it probably would. Yeah, and to a degree, it does with certain states, particularly. Um, there's a direct correlation. Uh, for some others, it's not, but for us, it it, it has to. Um, so more more to come on that, and I'm happy to once once that report is um also finished, we we have our second draft in place. I'm happy to also share it uh, if it's of interest. I, even just the, the catalog, cataloging the 100 initiatives. And then we're also trying to do the same for Maine. Um, so then people can have, um, I think, tangible information that if you're trying to learn about um, something, whitewater rafting, and how that is being, then you have a contact in another state who is doing that similar work. I, I think there's, there's value in the report uh, in many different ways. Thanks, Julia. Yeah, I think this group would be eager for that information. And I wonder, would it be helpful just for your records if we had everyone put their kind of name and location in the chat? Yeah, that'd be great. Then you can have um, a sense because we do have quite a spread here. Um, if folks don't mind our, doing that, that'd be great. Most of our main streets and then a, a good handful of affiliates. But feel free to hop in if anybody else has any other questions. Or ideas. And Tamara did say she was grateful in the chat um, for this type of work, the strategic planning and evaluation being done at the state level. Quantitative data is important to our planning as well as combating messaging that's not rooted in data. I have one more question. Um, I thought the, so we're getting ready to locally, our strategic plan needs to be evaluated and then updated. And I thought the slides that you just presented were really helpful. Um, are those available so I can steal some ideas from your presentation <laughs> for my strategic plan evaluation? Yeah, of course. I'm happy to to share it. Um, and again, if and then if you have more questions about specific slides, if, if, I, if I can get more granular, like the, the wage data, for example, we do have it per county in comparison to 2018 baseline. The population, we have a lot of um, data on that. So don't hesitate to reach out if there's other um, information that I already have put together into slides. So it really doesn't take that much effort for me to uh, share and forward. Um, that would be great. If you don't mind sharing it with me, then I'll send it out to this group yeah. along with your contact information. That's that'd be great. Um, I think the data piece too, uh, you've seen the progress report. I, I've always been a very data-driven person um, for many years, but now I'm in the quantitative side of the world, but I'm also interested on what is it that we're missing between the quantitative and the qualitative? How can we connect the dots a little bit better and 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 try to tell that story? Um, in different ways. So I'm also interested if if you have thoughts on that and what what would be helpful um, with just a photo or um, 
other ways that we can express what we're all trying to say here so that we can get everybody to uh, engage and be on board, regardless if they understand a chart or or um, they can you know, not, not read a, a sentence because English is not their first language or, or other elements. So, so trying to think of multiple ways that we can um, tell this, this story. I want to leave a little space if anyone else has anything else to share. Great. And we did, you know, do this recording and we'll send out the slides as well as Leah's contact information so that as you are communicating this work, um, you can have more of the data behind it and the state support. Mm -hmm. And Julia, you mentioned you're setting up and kind of distributing information and opportunity for feedback um, still around the state. And these, this is a great group to share out um, that opportunity. And so folks here can, um, yes, they've participated in this one specifically, but they can also send it out through their networks and channels in terms of opportunity for others in their communities to interact. Yes, I'm, I'm also going to share in my follow-up email um, a virtual survey that we have put together to capture individual level feedback. So it right. gives you a unique opportunity as you're an individual to provide this feedback in a more granular way. And also if you can just distribute that widely, um, we're trying to gather as many voices as possible to, to try to reflect uh, these sort of mini conversations that I'm having all over the state where we're holding about um, I think close to 65 meetings so far um, and then overall seven regional meetings but I think the virtual survey is really how we're going to get to um, a lot of individuals so if you don't mind distributing that would be we would be grateful great yeah send it my way and I'll include it in the follow-up email so folks who are able to attend today or are able to watch the recording and um, flip through your slides can also distribute it if they weren't able to make it this morning Okay, well, thank you so much for having me. Um, I appreciate the opportunity and it was great to meet many of you who haven't met before and see some familiar faces. Thank you so much for your time Thanks. and coming in. And and actually we're gonna get to see Julia next month as well, <laughs> presenting yeah. about um, some ARPA funding for new businesses. So um, we'll, we'll see you soon. <laughs> and thanks so much for doing this work and, and for involving us and really taking time to um, to incorporate that downtown focused perspective. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks, Julia. Bye. Sylvia. So, yeah, yeah oh, just say just thank say. you all. Uh, but Dave, you've got something for the group or I'll just stay on. Yeah, no, it's okay. I was just gonna ask if you could also in the follow-up, I think it would be helpful for a lot of the group to see that tourism overlay. Um, I know she mentioned